Okay. Looks like we are live. Shall we start with prayer, Deacon, before we get started? Sure. In the name of the Father, Let's and of the this. Son, Father, and of the Holy Son, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you uh, for this time. And even though we're facing tremendous difficulties during this time of COVID-19 and uh, the pandemic and sheltering in place and lockdowns, Lord, we know that, uh, that we find true freedom in your love, that even though we're restricted in body, we're restricted from moving from place to place, uh, is that your love gives us true freedom that your love and your will is what our hearts truly seek and desire in order to truly uh, find the happiness and fulfillment and the peace that we truly seek can only be found in you. So Lord, let us not be afraid. Let us not be uh, nervous. Let us not be distracted because as your loyal apostle tells us in his letter, uh, perfect love casts out all fear. So Lord, teach us how to love and uh, more than be afraid. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Deacon, for that. And uh, I want to welcome everyone to a, a special Guardians, uh, Shabal Raish, um, one of the hosts at Guardians. And this, um, this is a special one. Now, it's so late in the evening in Sydney. However, it's very early in the morning in America. So uh, Deacon, we might <laughs> let everyone know what time is it right now where you are? It is uh, on the Pacific Coast, the United States, 5 a.m. in the morning. 5 a.m. And now, now this it doesn't just end there. This is not your first show today. This is, this your is third. my third show today. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually have one more later this, the, in my time later this evening with uh, Jason Everett as well. So, Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow so much going on you are a machine uh we love you we thank you for for being such a committed warrior for christ and uh and thank you for joining us um during such a busy schedule of yours no i'm honored to be here charbel you know i'll do anything for you brother no. <laughs> you're a good man thank you well listen um i'd like to invite everyone we're on the guardians page live uh write any questions you have right now uh and i'll ask on your behalf throughout the show um, but the idea here is we want to, the theme of tonight, and uh, we're in lockdown, the whole world is in lockdown through, due to the COVID-19. How do we stay spiritually healthy during this time, Deacon? So that's the theme of, of, of today's session. Uh, and, and maybe we can break open some tips on how to keep our prayer life strong and what are other things we can do. So could I uh, invite you to kick us off here? Um, how do we stay spiritually healthy during COVID-19? Well, the, the, the thing is, you know, um, to stay spiritually healthy is either implies one of two things. Either we were already spiritually healthy and we want to get healthier or we weren't spiritually healthy and we need to get healthy spiritually. Uh, and, and so, so many people, I think, see this time of COVID-19 as a time of stress. And, and it is for a lot of people. I mean, let's be real. Um, some people aren't working. Um, I know for me, I took a 73% drop in income. You know, um, I, I literally haven't worked since um, since March. You know, I think the earliest that I'll be able to to get back out and, and start speaking again is August. You know, at wow. the, at the earliest. That's you know, so for you. Yeah, that's locally for yeah. me. And then and uh, so all the the pilgrimages have been canceled. You know, my 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 time coming to Australia, and uh, New Zealand has been postponed and all of that. And so uh, and a lot of people have been feeling restless i think they've been um being maybe caught up in some of the um uh in, in some of the um you know um uh the uh um you know the the, the fear mongers yeah. and all that kind of it's the end of the world and the book of revelation <laughs> all this kind of stuff you know look, you know I, I so so here's the way i think of it here's the way i think of it as, as this time think of it as a spiritual stop sign you know, when, when you're driving your, your car, you get to a stop sign, you stop. And what do you do? You look both ways, right? And then and then you proceed. So this time of COVID-19, this time of pandemic is, I think God is giving a spiritual stop sign. It's a time for us to stop, to pause, to look left and look right. Hey, where did I come from? How have I been going spiritually? And where am I going? Where is God leading me? And this is the time to really stop 
and, and, and uh, it's a kind of a forced pause on the whole world. And I think God wants to look at, hey, wait a minute, look at the direction we're heading in, more relativism in the culture, uh, the redefinition, uh, so, so-called redefinition of marriage, just transgenderism, all these, all these things that we're seeing in the culture that are turning us away from God. And God is giving us a time right now to stop and say, okay, hold on, as a society and as an individual, where am I right now? on my walk with God? What do I need to improve? How do I need to go deeper? Um, How do I allow God to uh, let me become more of the person that he created me to be? So I think this is a time of of, uh, more intense prayer and reflection that I think is going to have, you know, a tremendous ripple effect in the church. Now, the other thing is that obviously we haven't, a lot of us haven't been able to attend mass. And in the States now, things are Mm -hmm. starting to open up slowly you know, my own diocese opened up masses last weekend, uh, but very limited. You know, um, we can only have 25 people uh, in the church. And that includes the priests and, and the deacon and the uh, lectors and the, a couple people in the choir, that kind of thing. Plus the technicians, because we're still live streaming mass um, because everybody, you know, is not coming. So I think that causes stress on people. Um, and so, so I, I get that. But at the same time, I think there are tremendous opportunities here uh, to grow more deeply in our faith. Like, for example, I know for a fact that priests have been telling me that they've been noticing on when they're live streaming mass from the parish for adoration and things like this, is that people who have not been going to church, who have been disconnected from their faith, who they've not seen in church for years, have been watching mass online you know, um, uh, have been watching adoration, have been, you know, even my little, my little efforts that I've been doing, my little daily dose of Deacon Harold and my week, Walk by Faith weekly webinars, you know, I have hundreds of people signing up for these things and watching. So there's a hunger and there's, there's a need there that's being met, you know, during this COVID-19 through the online media. Now, you know, let's, you know, when, when, when things open back up again, we're able to go back to mass. Let's not get so used to streaming mass that that's the, you know, that we don't, we forget that we need to come together as the body of Christ and be with each other, not just uh, that's right. streaming, you know? Um, but I think more per- personally, I think this, we should really use this time. I know I have been to kind of evaluating, okay, I left my job eight years ago. Um, okay. W- what am I doing? Where am I going? What does this mean now that I'm not speaking for these months? How maybe God's asked me to do a shift here. Maybe I should be looking at things differently. Maybe I should do more uh, uh, online media offerings, that that kind of thing. So yeah, I've also been in a a time of prayer and reflection um, as well. So uh, I think that's the first point about uh, how we can be more prayerful during this time of uh, COVID-19. Yeah, thank you. I I think it's um, beautiful, beautifully put. Um, you know that it is it is a, a a great opportunity rather than be sort of uh, buried in the negativity of the whole thing and say look we've lost everything look the whole globe's in this together everyone is is in this and suffering in, in one way or another um, uh, events completely cancelled you know uh, I totally understand that for the rest of the year that's why we're doing guardians on online and uh, mass I mean what a big what a big deal I mean we're not having access to the sacraments. Um, in St. Charles, for example, you know, you've got a parish of tens of thousands of people uh, on any given Sunday. It's, it's, it's upwards of six, seven, eight thousand people that would typically go uh, to, a sun, to Sunday Mass, you know, throughout the Masses and when you add them all up. And to be asked, you know, we're, in Australia, we're limited to 10. Um, and so, man, what do you do? I mean, you're going to get a roster. You can imagine people just um, jumping on top of it, fighting for the top 10 spot. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, it, it's going to be very difficult. So how, um, how do we, as, as Catholics, you know, enter into sacramental life when we don't have access to the sacraments? Um, what do we do in this time? We don't even know how long this is going to last. Well, you know, there's a saying, I'm not sure if they have it in Australia as well, but uh, we say absence makes the heart grow fonder. Right. So, so when you're away from somebody that you love, you miss them. You know, sometimes I can't stand being around this person, or I'm, I'm kind of spending too much time with this person, kind of sick of being around them. I need to go away. When you go away, oh gosh, I really miss them. And I think that's what we're experiencing now with the sacramental life for the church. 
you know, we, we, we love Jesus. We love the Holy Sacrifice of Mass and receiving him, body, blood, soul, divinity, the Eucharist, and in his word and word and sacrament and the Holy Mysteries, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But now we, um, because the bishop is trying to comply uh, with, you know, governmental regulations about keeping people safe, you know, uh, we've not all been able to get the Mass. And so sometimes people get angry, they blame the bishops. You know, why are you taking Jesus from us? Like in the States, for example, you can go to the store or, you know, uh, some, some things are considered essential services. So, yeah. for example, alcohol, you can go buy alcohol and beer because those places are open, but you can't go to mass. So people are like, wait, wait a minute. How is that considered an essential? Or or here, you know, marijuana uh, is, is legal. So the, the marijuana stores can be open, but you can't go to mass. I mean, just <laughs> it's like, what? Um, you know, uh, so I, I think people get frustrated because of that and they want to point fingers and um, uh, blame the bishops and things. But but here's the thing. I think being away from the sacraments teaches us that we cannot take our faith for granted, you know, um, and that this this longing, this desire that we have. Yes, you can watch mass streaming on, on television. I know that many families have had, you know, they dress up like if they were going to mass on Sunday and they have the chairs set up and have the kids there and, and they and they watch mass streaming from their parish or from uh, if their parish is doing it from another parish in their diocese or even from the Vatican or EWTN or something like that. And, and they they act like as they were at mass, they kneel and they stand and they'd say the responses just like if they were there, except they're watching it through the television. That's one way. Um, watching adoration. I, I, I've been, you know, I, I'm a weekly adoration because it's been killing me not being able to go to adoration for the last couple of months, you know, and I'm used to going every single week you know, and um, uh, so watching it online, streaming online, but again, not the same as being there. I get it, but still finding that time for silence and being in the presence of the Lord and praying that rosary and just, you know, just um, um, uh, allowing God to enter into your life and praying for an end to this thing uh, as well. So I think, yeah, so we can participate uh, in the life of the church uh, in, in a different way right now. Like, for example, Char, this is interesting, Sharba. I just got an email literally yesterday from, <laughs> and, and I haven't responded back to him yet because it's a little bit political, but um, he, he had a baby born right before all the lockdown started. Like right after the kid was born, everything was locked down and he kept baptized the baby. And so it's been months wow. now and they, and, and they want the baby baptized, but they, they haven't allowed baptisms to happen yet. So he called me, you go, Hey, they're opening up churches down there where you are in your diocese. Can we come down there and, and you do the baptism? I'm like, Ooh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that because think about it, you know, when the, his diocese finds out, finds out that all you got to do is go down here and they'll do the baptism. That's, right. that's not, that's not good. So I see, so I see the, the frustration and the longing there. Um, but at the same time, remember, we this puts us in solidarity with many of our brothers and sisters in the continent of Africa, uh, in places like China, in places like uh, Korea, even in places in, uh, in, in the Middle East where people are uh, deprived from even going to church through religious persecution. So they haven't been able to go to masses for, for much longer than we have, you know? So this, I think this is also puts us in solidarity and I think it opened our hearts more deeply to the situation for other people around the world who through, um, again, this is a, a, a medical thing with, with, a, with a, a virus, but this puts us in solidarity with all those other Christians um, who cannot go to mass or it's dangerous to go to mass. And they still try to go, even though it might cost them their lives mm -hmm. to be in that relationship with Jesus. So I think that actually brings us closer and brings us into more unity with this, with the church suffering around the world. This is a great point you're making. Um, we've got to really, I mean, there's two ways of looking at this situation and let's look at this, this one for Catholics right now. Um, especially those in the West, uh, those who, who have internet, who's watching this now, those who have, uh, the ability to work from home or those who have um, opportunities to, to be able to live stream and, and still be connected in some way. Think about what it could potentially be. Imagine now the internet breaks down. And I was really worried for a while that uh, the internet was going to bust at some point because my 
in our area, our internet was slowing right down. I'm thinking, man, if everyone's on the internet right now and it's just really going to slow down, this is going to bust. Uh, but, but I thought if that goes, then what's next? You know, and imagine now life without internet and now life without electricity. You know, we've had blackouts as well. Life without water. I mean, now, now all of a sudden you've got to start thinking, you know what? We're, we're, we're safe. We stay safe. We're alive. We'll be sensible. We thank God for the opportunity we have. We're, we're bonding with our families. We, um, we are not being persecuted with bombs and, and, and explosions and, and our lives in the same sense as those persecuted in, in the Middle East and, and Africa and Asia, as you say. So thanks be to God, it could be a lot worse. Um, but putting that aside, you know, we, we also have got to count our blessings that um, we have the opportunity to join in prayer, not just tuning in on mass, um, but with the universal church. How, I mean, how powerful is it? As you said, some families, that's quite interesting, wearing, um, dressing up as if it's Sunday mass or for mass. So, so are we, although the screen is there, are we, and the, and the mass is live, we actually are participating, aren't we still? Even though we're not sacramentally receiving Jesus, what, what's where God's presence is still there present. We should still, I guess, respect that time um, during the mass, even though it's live streamed. Yes, it's a participating what's called spiritual communion. Okay. You know, um, so this is this is something that um, great saints have done. Uh, saints who have been in prison, saints who, um, especially I think of the missionaries that have gone to mm. to China or even North America, where they're where they're bringing the faith, where they're bringing the faith in Jesus Christ, and they were um, you know put in prison or tortured, and they could not re- priests could not celebrate the mass or could not receive. Uh, the sacraments as well. So they made a spiritual communion. Um, so yes, it's not the same as receiving Jesus, <laughs> body, blood, soul, divinity in the Eucharist, but you're still making that that heart to heart connection uh, with the Lord, right? Um, you're, you're, you're still adoring him. You're still worshiping him. You're still, see, that, that's the thing. That's the desire is there. The desire is there. And that's what God honors is the, is the desire. Um, you know, the fact that you're making that effort to even though you can't be at mass, to still attend mass via live streaming or, or via uh, YouTube, you're still making that effort. And that shows that you still have that desire to love him. You still have the desire to make, um, to connect your life with, with, the, with the life of the Lord again uh, in a spiritual way. Um, mm-hmm. But I think God honors that and God respects that. Um, you know, and I think one of the reasons why we're going through this is to, I think, bring people be bring people to a deeper love of Christ to bring us from just this surface kind of just you know kind of going every week and punching the clock and showing up for mass like wait a minute well wait a minute I haven't been to mass in a couple months now well you know and and now I think it it's um um uh, allowing this faith the, the faith to flourish in our lives in a way that it that it hasn't been in a long time um you know for me you know I've been blessed in the sense that um we've been live streaming mass and, and father uh, has had me serve with him as an altar as a deacon. So I have been able to go to mass. And as a deacon, one of the things that I've been doing in this regard, Charbel, is that the deacon represents the people at the altar. So the priest represents Christ and the deacon represents the people represents the church at the altar with Christ. And so when I'm there, I'm, I'm very consciously aware that I am representing the people of God who, especially those who cannot attend mass right now, who are watching live stream, and I'm representing them at that altar. Um, and, and so I'm very, very conscious of that uh, and very uh, honored to be able to, to, to do that role. And I pray um, every mass for all the people who cannot, uh, cannot attend. So again, I'm making that spiritual sacrifice and connection for all the people uh, who through no fault of their own are not able to attend the Holy Sacrifice of the mass now. And here's the thing, I love that uh, you're representing us. We are still united. We're still united. It's no fault of our own. So uh, God sees that. And so we shouldn't feel, um, I guess, um, you know, we can be, uh, in one sense, angry or upset. Um, but let's turn that energy into prayer. And uh, what I'd love to do, and, and look, one little comment, I want to acknowledge people who are commenting. We're, we're streaming on multiple pages at the moment. So St. Charles Youth Association page. Guardians, Perusia Media, Cradio, we're on multiple Sydney Catholic events. 
Um, and so there's people commenting on different pages here. So I just want to make one little uh, shout out to Helena who made a little comment here. Uh, this is like being in the upper room during the COVID lockdown. Come Holy Spirit, come. <laughs> How can we grow more yeah, in love with the third person really the good. Holy yeah. and receive the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit during this time when the sacraments aren't available to us? And perfect timing because we enter into the nine day novena leading up to uh, Pentecost. And so we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and this, this could be more timely, this, this talk right now. Um, yeah, great comment there. Um, thank you, Helena. Deacon, practical, let's get practical now. Um, there are so many things. Uh, now you've mentioned, you just quickly passed through the rosary, uh, live streaming mass. What other things? Now, I'd love to touch on the life of the church, the prayer of the church. Um, if you can't make mass, there is what's called you know, the extension to the liturgy, the liturgy of the hours. Could we touch on that? Because you're, you're quite um, familiar with that yourself and, and you practice it. And, and just as are uh, you, Charbel, we, we've prayed yes, the liturgy of the hours right. together many times. That's you right. Know? That's right. Yeah. I personally love it. I've, I've never, our family prayer life has really gone to a whole new level during this time. We pray and I pray both. It's, it's funny, but uh, being Maronite, but in Australia. So I have a Maronite divine office, liturgy of the hours. And we follow we follow that uh, those who are watching Safro and and uh, and Ramsho, which is the evening, and there's also morning. And Saint Charbel's, um, and you should all know this. Uh, stream this on Facebook every morning, seven thirty. It's beautiful to join in with the monks, and they're just chanting the psalms. And then in the evening as well, and they unite it with mass. So sort of the liturgy of the word is like this extension of um, the liturgy of the hours as part of. Then they go into liturgy of the Eucharist. And then I do the same thing in evening prayer. So that's on every single day. And then in the evening in English, there's, there's also eight o'clock every day on, on the St. Charles page. Um, you can also participate uh, with the youth. And so they've got adoration. They've got liturgy of the hours and mass all at once. So take advantage of that. But let's just unpack what is the power of the liturgy of the hours. Could we, we're going to have some fun now. This is quite, quite special. <laughs> well, there's the two. Yeah, there, there's two forms of public prayer in the church. The first form of public prayer is the holy sacrifice of the mass. Right, that's the that's the uh, primary way in which we express ourselves publicly in the church. So, for example, if the priest is saying mass by himself, we sometimes we we, we colloquially call it a private mass, but actually, there's no, no such thing as a private mass. Because every mass is the the uh, the work of the church and the work of the people on behalf of the church. So even if there's no one there, it, it's a public form of prayer of the church. The other public prayer of the church is the divine office or the liturgy of the hours, and the liturgy of the hours um, is a way of sanctifying the day. So as you mentioned, Charbel, there's morning the the, the hinge what they call the hinge hours morning prayer obviously in the morning and evening prayer at night you know kind of the book ends of the day you know the beginning of the day and the end of the day but there's also prayers in between there's what there's called matins which happens before the sun comes up you know mm -hmm. and then there's a uh, morning prayer which happens when the sun is up and then you have midday prayer actually you have mid morning prayer midday yes. prayer mid afternoon prayer then evening prayer and then compline uh in, in at night before you how go many to bed. is that you just you just you There's, just listed how many hours then seven. yeah so seven yeah seven. <laughs> because wow. why remember psalm 119 seven times a day i praise you O lord wow. so when the liturgy of the hours would be, was being put together by the monks of the early church starting with saint anthony and of course saint benedict is the one who really popularized this for the for the at least at least for the church in the west um because saint benedict is called the father of western monasticism and he was the one who kind of put that all together um, and organized it um, in, in what we know today to be Liturgy of the Hours. Um, but uh, and, and the bulk of the Liturgy of the Hours is called the Sefer Telahim, which is the book of sung praises or mm -hmm. the Psalms, right? Yes, so the yes. Psalms were, was the hymnal uh, of, the, of the Jewish people. And we, now we have the Psalms in the Mass, of course, but they play, they play a small role in the Mass. But in the Liturgy of the Hours, the bulk of that prayer is the Psalms, you know, and they're just so incredibly beautiful. I mean, I've been praying the Psalms, gosh, since uh, since high school, since I started wow. my first 
uh, experience staying uh, living in a monastic setting was in high school. And um, and that's why I first was exposed to liturgy hours. I've been praying them, uh, what, what 40, 40 years now. And I never get tired of praying it every day. You know, I love it. And the liturgy of the hours is on the four week cycle. So it basically, it, it takes the bulk of the Psalms. There's some Psalms that aren't said at all. Um, uh, Psalms 58, 83, and 109 because they're called cursing psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those aren't included in, in the cycle. And there are some psalms that are, that are seasonal. So for example, right now, during the Lent and Easter season, we're doing um, some of the psalms that tells the, the, uh, the, the history of, sal uh, of salvation, how God worked through the Old Testament, through Moses, and Abraham and Moses and all that, to, you know, and, and, and now in Christ. Um, so, uh, but, but it's just a, a way of sanctifying the day. And it's really like a liturgy of the word service. Yes. You start off with a song and then you have the Psalms uh, and then you have a little reading afterward then a responsory and then you have a, a, an antiphon and then you do in the, the uh, Benedictus for morning prayer. And the Benedictus is the prayer that uh, Zacharias said at, at uh, the circumcision of John the Baptist. Remember his mouth was open, but he, he couldn't talk. Because, right. you know, Gabriel came to him when he was in the, the Holy of Holies because uh, he was the high priest that year. And he, he was, you know, throwing incense on the mercy seat. And Gabriel says, hey, guess what? You're, uh, you thought you were too old to have a kid. You and Elizabeth could have a baby. It's going to be John the Baptist, forerunner of the Christ. He was like, huh? <laughs> we too old. You know, it's like, ah, oh, dude, now you're not going to be able to talk until the circumcision, right? And so at the, at the circumcision, when he said his name, when he wrote down his name is John, his tongue was loosened. And he gave us that beautiful Benedictus prayer. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free, right? And yes. then in the evening, we say the Magnificat. Mary's beautiful prayer when, when John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb. And Mary just, that, that beautiful, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, my spirit exalts in God, my Savior. You know, and then we have awesome. petitions, prayer petitions. And then we have the Our Father and a prayer at the end. So it's almost like a liturgy of the, of the word uh, service, if, if you will. But it's a beautiful way to sanctify the day. Well, I'll give you an example. Psalm 63. That's a psalm that I pray every time I start off my adoration time. And it's a psalm that said on feasts and solemnities. Um, that, that psalm is always said, Oh God, you are my God. For you, I long. For you, my soul is thirsting. My body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. For your love is better than life. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, that, that to me is just absolutely mind-blowing. Because think about it. Right. There I am sitting before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And I'm actually saying, and now this psalm, these psalms are written 800 years. Um, before Jesus was even around. Um, I gaze upon you in the sanctuary, and I'm there before the, Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, to see your strength and your glory, for your love is better than life. And I think about all the martyrs and all those who died and all those who sacrificed uh, and gave their lives so that we can enjoy the faith that we have today, because God's love for them was better than their own life. I was like, what? I mean, that's just, I mean, I could just spend an hour just meditating on that in adoration. Yes. You know, so that's that what the Psalms, yeah, the Psalms are just so beautiful. I mean, I think every emotion I've experienced, uh, every feeling I've ever had, um, it, you can find that in the Psalms. It just, it's a way a of bringing point. us with deep, more intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And a great way for communion with him, especially if you can't get the master the liturgy, the hours is the other public prayer to church. Absolutely beautiful and the what's great about it is um you can have them on you can get it on an app yes you know you can um uh if you go to your, like i breathery um right if you can go on your phone and you can uh download you can download the app you can get the entire literature the hours right here on your phone um or you could use the the book i have the uh, four volume book this is one of the volumes that i use here um, and that's why I don't use the phone. I don't use the phone like when I'm traveling on a plane and, and or something like that. But uh, normally I just use the book. But um, no excuse now. This is the way we that's use right. technology as a tool 
to deepen and strengthen our faith. Like the Liturgy of the Hours is a great way to do that. Peter, I've, I'm impressed you're using a different trans. You're using the translation we use in Australia, that psalm, because I've uh, I've heard you say that psalm in the past and it was a different translation. Now you're sort yeah, of following see, a very similar psalm because I'm very familiar with those that, that translation of the psalms. Yeah, so a, a, a little bit, we get a little off to the side here from the discussion but <laughs> but um so when the psalms were, were translated uh for the liturgy hours they used what's called the grail translation of the psalms which is basically it was the french translation of the psalms into english but what we're using now is what's called um you can see this here the revised yeah. grail uh okay. I don't know if you can see that but it's the revised grail so the the grail psalms now are much more faithful to the hebrew <laughs> um, so it has a lot of Hebrew uh, idioms and, and, and uh, uh, much more faithful to the actual Hebrew language. The other yes. one was more of a, what's called a, um, a dynamic equivalence translation, which is still beautiful. So for example, if we take that same Psalm 63 here, it says, Oh God, you are my God at dawn. I seek you for you. My soul is thirsting for you. My flesh is pining mm, like a dry yeah. weary land without water. I've come before you in the sanctuary to behold your strength and your glory. Your loving mercy is better than life. You see the differences there? Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the language there. Um, so it, it, it and also, so there's two things with this translation. One, it's much more faithful to the Hebrew. And second, it follows the, the new rules for translation, liturgicum authenticum, that was put into place by the Vatican, um, by John Paul II. Um, new translation norms for document for uh, for uh, uh, readings that we use in the mass. So anyway, a little a little off to the side there. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. But that's why the translations are are a little are a little bit different. But yeah, universalist.com is another uh, great website. Those are and and for the Maronites there, I encourage you again go to the the Saint Charles Youth um, Association page or the Saint Charles Monastery page. They are praying the the Divine Office every morning and every evening. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can time in and the English is, is, is an Arabic in the morning. Um, and then in, in the, in the late evening at eight, it's in English. So tune in and, and get, get in, in touch with that. So powerful. The Psalms, I mean, Jesus prayed the Psalms, of course. Um, and, um, and, and so we can't forget the power of this and links. And there was, a, there wasn't there a time in history where we didn't have daily mass. We had, we had the liturgy of the hours that connected Sunday to Sunday, wasn't there? It was just early yes. on in the church where. It, this was a, this is a this is a huge privilege to have um, daily mass. It wasn't the case, uh, you know, centuries ago when when it was only on Sundays, and then you'd have the liturgy of the hours that would connect you Sunday to Sunday. So quite powerful. Thank you, Deacon. Yeah, now, that's, right. that's a powerful prayer, and that's a great one. You can pray with the family, or if you pray on your own. Or um, now the rosary. Uh, does anything um, change? I mean, a time like this, praying the rosary. How powerful is this prayer? I mean, the rosary, if you can talk a bit about that. I know I've heard you use analogies oh for the rosary before. Yeah, the rosary is just amazing. I have one here, um, and this is basically made of nuts and bolts because <laughs> this is called the St. Joseph the Worker Rosary. You oh, know, wow. so obviously, you know, it has the nuts and the bolts on it. It's beautiful. It actually, it was created by a teenager um, in, in our state of Texas. And I was down there before this whole COVID nineteen, and uh, and I and I I bought one of. I wanted to support him in the work that he's doing for the Lord, so I, I bought this one. But the rosary, see, see, let me let me, let me put it like this. I remember um, I was um, when I when I was working in, in my secular job, um, you know, it was uh, it was winter time, so it got dark fairly early, and I was I was um, being a gentleman walking this young lady, administrative assistant in our office, to her car. And as we're walking past my car to get to her car, uh, there was a rosary bead hanging from the rear view mirror. Now this young lady, um, uh, was she, I guess she'd call herself Catholic, but she was only baptized. No first reconciliation, no first communion, didn't go to mass, nothing, just basically ritual baptism when she was a baby. And so we're walking by, she looks and she sees the rosary hanging from my rear view window. She goes, is that, that's a rosary? I said, yes. She said, that's the thing with all the Hail Marys on it. I'm like, yeah, you want to see how it works? <laughs> so, I, so I went in the recent, got the rosary and I showed it to her, was explained it to her. And she looked at me, she goes, why do you do that? 
Ah, see, now the door is open, the opportunity. Now, I could have said, well, let me tell you about the Battle of Lepanto in 1517, <laughs> and let me, uh, 1571, and let me tell you about, you know, how uh, uh, the Blessed Mary of Jerusalem revealed the rosary to St. Dominic. No, she asked, why do you do that? Personal question. So I explained to her, I said, all I'm doing is praying, um, reflecting on the mysteries of our salvation, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so for, I said, for example, the joyful mysteries, the Annunciation. I said, you, and I said, you remember that's when the angel came to Mary. Oh yeah, that's when Mary found out she's going to be the mother of God. Yes. I said, so when, when I'm praying that mystery, I'm reflecting, you know, how do I say yes? How do I find the courage to say yes in my life? to everything that God is asking of me, do I have that same level of faith and trust that the Blessed Virgin Mary have? Even though she didn't fully understand all the mm -hmm. implications of her yes, she had the courage to follow Jesus and to say, and to follow God, to say yes to what God wanted to do in her life. Do I have that same kind of uh, uh, courage and that same kind of childlike trust in God? Uh, the visitation, when uh, Mary, is pregnant with Jesus, goes to visit her kinswoman, Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist, that beautiful interaction between the two of them, you know, and who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me, you know, um, and, uh, and, and John the Baptist leapt in her womb because he recognized he was in the presence of God and, and Mary was the monstrance. And when that monstrance walked in, because she held Jesus' body, blood, soul, divinity, in the tabernacle in the monstrance of her womb, John the Baptist recognized that he leapt in her womb. I said, you know, how do I react when, when I'm in the presence of the Lord? How does the presence of the Lord in my life make any difference in the way I think, in the way I act, um, in the way I interact with others? You know, um, uh, the birth of Christ, and nativity. How do I give birth to Christ in my own life? How am I Eucharist to the world? You know, I, we leave the Mass, we, you know, our job, we just received Jesus' word and sacrament. And our job is to be Eucharist to the world, to show people Jesus, to be the, the hands and the heart and the feet of Jesus in the world. How, how am I doing that? You know, I mean, so, so that, and I, we went during, through during some your, of the mysteries. The rosary, you're thinking of this. Uh, yes. As and I'm, so I'm, as I'm praying, yes, we ended up talking for, for almost an hour in that, in that parking lot about the rosary. Wow. And uh, so many saints have used the rosary. People from like, say, Louis de Montfort. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Padre Pio, you know, um, uh, Jose Maria Escriba all called this a weapon. John Paul too uh, gave us the, he, he loved the rosary, dedicated the Blessed Mother so much, he gave us the luminous mysteries, you know, and, and so the, the rosary is an absolute powerful prayer. Um, you want the devil to run from your life? Start praying a rosary every day and you'll see him go, and you'll see him go away. Now, again, some people just because you know, they get lost in the fact they're just repeating the art, the Hail Marys over and over again, you kind of your mind starts wandering, you start getting lost and things like that. Uh, so there's different aids that can assist in praying the rosary. There's something called the scriptural rosary. Mm -hmm. So there's a little line of scripture that helps brings you into the mystery, helps you reflect on that mystery, the rosary as you're praying it. So it's called the scriptural rosary. Um, you know, or John Paul II and that document where he gave us the uh, luminous mysteries also talks about a technique in there where like when you're praying to Hail Mary, uh, uh, bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So if you're playing like the, um, uh, the sorrowful mysteries, who gave his life for us on the cross, Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us there is now. So after, after yeah. the name of Jesus, you add a little prayer that um, helps expand your way of thinking about that particular mystery. Um, so that's, it's just, that's very good. Yeah, and I, I love using that, especially on the plane, because you're so distracted with what's going on around you that so, although I'm not flying anywhere now, but 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 I use that one on, on the on the plane a lot. Or one of the things I do, I download the, the the prayer of like Mother Angelica and the nuns on EWTN. And I and I have it on my phone. I listen to that and I pray along with them, you know, as, as they're praying the rosary. You know, so um just it's just so awesome. many ways. It's such as the spiritual fruits are tremendous of praying the rosary every day. Um, I'd like to echo um, one of Bernadette uh, who commented here. Uh, if you if you lose your rosary, you still got your ten fingers. I mean, yes, so you can that's still right. Pray, that's right. Pray with Amen. your ten fingers. Um, 
if you lose everything and uh, I've just answered your question there, you can get the morning and evening Psalms. There's one copy, but there are many others uh, and I encourage everyone to, to search that. Um, I, w I want to encourage everyone last uh, 20 minutes here to ask questions. We do have a question here um, from John Pierre, but before I ask that, John, just to keep Deacon on track, I just want one more thing about the rosary, just uh, on the prayer uh, order of prayer. So, you know, it said, you know, the liturgy is the most, is the highest form of prayer, the liturgy, um, the divine liturgy. And then you have liturgy of the hours or probably an extension of that. So sort of there's your one, two. Rosary is, is sort of the, the, an interesting one because it's, it's a devotional prayer, but it's the, would it be the highest of the devotional prayers? But also I, I remember its understanding is that it's, it's like a layman's um, Psalter. Like it was almost, was it, use because of the 50 Hail Marys. If you said it three times, that's 150 Psalms uh, traditionally. Um, but Lexio Divina. So can I touch on that? Because that's um, such an important way of also reading scripture. Um, can we, what is that? And what are some pr practical tips you could give us on how to practice that? Yeah, so Lexio Divina basically is a divine reading uh, of the of the scriptures, a, a way of entering more deeply into God's word, and so traditionally the the form there's, there's four different um, uh, uh, levels. So you start off with lexio. So basically, that's just reading the scripture, you know. And it doesn't matter. Take your favorite line of scripture, like First um, John four sixteen. God is love, and he who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. Okay, something like that. Mm -hmm. So you take that verse or, or you take several verses and you and you just read through them. So the first stage is just reading the scripture slowly, reflectively, so it starts to sink into your heart, right? Uh, again, you can start with your favorite Bible passage, the one that means the most to you. Uh, it could it'd be just even one of the parables of Jesus could be a way of, of, a, of a launching point. And so you just read it, go to a quiet place, you immerse yourself in that word of God and you allow that word to begin to touch you as you're reading it. You give your full attention to it. You might even want to pray out loud. You can actually hear yourself praying uh, the words. Uh, and you might want to emphasize each word. For example, in John chapter 832, um, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So one way you might enter into the Lexio is you will know the truth and the truth will set you free or emphasize a different word. Mm -hmm. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free or you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You see, <laughs> are you emphasizing different words there? Same so thing, just the, emphasizing a word. Yeah, exactly. And then, then from Lex, you enter into what's called meditation, meditatio in Latin or meditation or, or reflection. So you think about the text that you chose and you begin to um, ruminate over it. You begin to just let it sink into your heart. Um, and when you finish reading it, you just pause and recall something about the reading that stood out to you, something that that touches you, something that uh, that spoke to your life, to your situations, to your needs, to your circumstances that are going on in your life right now. And then you go into oratio, which is um, uh, a response. So that's where we speak to God and where you've uh, read and meditated on that word. And now you have a dialogue with God. Okay, God, what are you saying to me? This, this word that you just, that I just prayed is hitting me. Lord, what are you saying to me? How am I to respond to, to this word that you're feeding me with in my life right now? Um, you know, so because the things you have to allow the word of God to change your life. It's not so we're not just reading stuff in a book. Yeah, yeah. That's God speaking to us. So how, how are we going to allow that word to be transformative in our life to take us from from just being just like, you know, regular Catholics take us to begin to take us to that next level to allow God's work to speak to our life and to and begin to incorporate that uh, into our everyday lived experience. And then finally, this contemplation. Uh, once I've done all of that, um, it's just resting in God, uh, uh, being overwhelmed by God's tenderness, his patience, his mercy, his forgiveness, his love, um, and just contemplating that. Um, and so I, that's just a, a quick kind of way that you can yeah, enter nice. into that Lexio Divina. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, uh, you touched on meditation. 
med what is meditation um, and, and what are tips, just general meditation? So do you always need the scriptures to meditate or can you, me what is meditation? You know, some people might think of uh, what we think of uh, in yoga classes with where they meditate oh, or, or yeah. Tai Chi or, or Buddhism. But what is meditation, Catholic meditation? Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so we're not talking about any uh, any of those other things, um, yoga, anything like that. When we're talking about meditation is that we're we're reflecting on uh, on God's word or reflecting on the impact of God in our own lives. And uh, we're trying to incorporate more of God into our life every day. So it's thinking about how can I make deeper connections? How can I make a, a, a deeper inroad? Um, a, a much stronger connection between my faith life and my everyday lived experience, you know? So it's, 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 it's taking God's words, reflecting on it. And it's allowing that word to speak to me, to come to my heart um, and to bring me into closer communion with Jesus. So for example, that's one of the things I think um, the rosary does, because think about it, we're reflecting on the mysteries of Christ. So you have the joyful mysteries, the beginning of, of Christ's life. Um, then you have the, well, if you, not, not in order, but uh, then you have like the, the luminous mysteries, right? That, that whole part of Jesus's public ministry. Then you have the sorrowful mysteries, right? And then you have the glorious mysteries. But you look at that's a whole continuum of the life of Christ. And so as I'm praying the rosary, I, I, I'm meditating upon, because um, because Mary always wants to bring us closer to her son, okay? Mm -hmm. So then, so then, in, in praying the rosary or, or any other kind of meditative kind of activity, how am I becoming more one with Christ? Uh, how am I allowing my life to be more in line with the life of Christ? Uh, how am I um, uh, uh, turning back maybe on that, on that road to um, uh, uh, the prodigal son, turning back toward God and walking back toward him in mercy and forgiveness? How am I being a vehicle of God's mercy to someone else in my life. That, those are things that we meditate on, making those deeper connections uh, with our faith and with Jesus Christ. Yeah, brilliant. Thank, and any, anything else I haven't touched on? I mean, that's, there's some important things, areas we can focus on. Um, before I dive in some questions, we've got a, a couple of questions here that, that uh, Bill of Apologetics to dive into the last 15, 10 to 15 minutes here. But what... Um, Anything else we missed that you can recommend for people uh, it, to really nourish their prayer life? Well, one thing people sometimes ask me, what version of the Bible should I use? I say, okay. use the version of the Bible that you're actually going to pick up and read, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but make sure it's the Catholic one, right? So it has all the books yeah. of the Bible in it, right? So it has 73 books. So if your Bible has 66 books, then, you know, you want to make sure you get a Catholic one that has the other books in it, right? Judith, Tobit, Wisdom. Sirach, Baruch, one and two Maccabees, and then a parts of the book of Daniel, parts of the book of Ezra. So you want to make sure you have the, com the complete, uh, all, yes. all the books. And, and, and here's the thing when it comes to prayer, the real cross of prayer is to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of every single situation in our lives. So even during this time of COVID-19 and lockdown, Jesus Christ is Lord of every single situation in my life the you know, the, the, the scientists aren't God, the government's not God. Then the, Jesus Christ is Lord of every single situation in my life. There's nothing, even COVID-19 that can separate us from the love of God and how wow. we respond in this time of pandemic to, uh, to what's going on reflects, I think, uh, our trust in God's love for us. All right. Um, and so we shouldn't be anxious, you know, like what does Jesus say? Look at the, are the birds in the air anxious. They have everything that they need. You know, you're thinking I'm going to provide for you too. And if you can't pray anything else, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I give my life to you. If you can't say anything else, if you have, if you have no word, just Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I give my life to you. Beautiful, beautiful. You, look, that is that is so powerful. You just said uh, we are unbreakable if we have faith in Jesus in our in our Lord. Uh, nothing will shake us from that relationship. Uh, any pandemic that comes our way, even death, you know, right down to persecution, it's it's that grace we ask for that the saints had right to the death. We stay loyal. We stay strong. We stay in peace in Christ, and that's so powerful. So 
that, that's brilliant. Thank you for that reminder, Deacon. Um, we have uh, Jean Pierre. I'm going to ask this question now. He's got two questions, uh, but let's start with the first one on apologetics. Uh, he wants to ask about the Inquisition. Um, how do we respond to that? Many of the Protestant uh, uh, brothers and sisters use that against the Catholic Church to say, you know, that, that, to put it against the church. How do we respond, particularly about the Inquisition, the issue that comes around all of that? Okay. Well, um, back in 1997, Pope John Paul II um, established a commission to look at the Inquisition. Because mm -hmm. remember, we're going to the, 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 two, the year 2000 was the Jubilee year. Okay, so as in preparation for the Jubilee year, Pope John Paul II commissioned 30 scholars. I think only two or three of them were Christians. To He, he allowed them access to the Vatican archives to study the Inquisition for five years, for five years. At the end of the five years, they put out an 800 page document. In fact, if you go to the Vatican, you can actually see it in the Vatican archive. It's 800 pages. Um, and, and there was a press conference where they had an executive summary. And, and they talked about, well, here's the things that we found. And no one's ever heard of this. Why? Because guess what? It wasn't as bad as everybody thinks. Here's basically what the synopsis is. Um, back in the in, in, in the in the mid, mid, medieval times, um, it was a, a crime against the state to be a heretic. So it wasn't just a crime against the church; it was a crime against wow. the state because the church is wow. state intertwined. So, yes. for example, if you were a heretic, you went to a secular court. You went not not the church. There was no church court. You go to the secular court, and these people who are not theologians would say, "Ooh." That sounds really bad. Yeah. Death. Ooh, that heresy. So I don't like what you're saying there. Death. So they were putting people to death. So Pope Lucius the third stepped in and said, uh, you know what, guys? How about this? How about you let us handle it? Because, you know, we're kind of the experts in this whole faith yeah. thing. And so he set up, and, and the style of court was called the Inquisition style because it was question and answer. It was dialogue back and forth. That, that's where the word inquisition comes from. It means to inquire. It's just question back and forth. And so he, uh, put Lucius uh, um, commissioned the, the Dominicans to be the, the ones that did. Now, what was his goal? His goal said, these people who are heretics are sheep who are lost, and I am the shepherd of the church, and my job is to bring the sheep back into the fold. And so this commission mm -hmm. uh, studied um, you know, uh, somewhere around 300,000 cases, uh, 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 Inquisition cases. And they found that um, uh, only 1.7% of those uh, were put to death by the state. The church put nobody to death during the Inquisition, zero people, because the church had no authority to put anybody to death. The state did. So what would happen was, you know, so you had 90, you know, 90 uh, 8.3 percent of the people would actually come back into the church, uh, but there was a, there were a, a, a few of them who were who were hard hearted. So they said, "Wait a minute! Once you leave this Inquisition, if you're still holding the position that you're holding, the state is going to put you to death." And that's and that's what happened. Okay. Now, was there some corruption, just like this corruption in the church now? <laughs> mm -hmm. There was corruption mm -hmm. back then, but it was very it was small. Um, so, I mean, so we have to learn the facts uh, about this. And what happened was wh where we, where we come uh, to where we think about the Inquisition that the church killed all these people, put all these people to death. Those were black legends created by our Protestant brothers and sisters. Remember, because the, 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 um, Inquisition extended all the way into the Protestant Reformation. And so as a way of pushing back against that, that's when they created all the black legends and the lies uh, regarding what the Inquisition actually was. And that's why John Paul II commissioned them to study it. And they came out and showed that the Inquisition actually uh, was about, well, for example, um, Saving Nations of Loyola went through the Inquisition when he came out with the spiritual exercises. Here he is, he, he's a lay person, no theological training, and he's teaching people these spiritual exercises that, that no one's ever seen before. I mean, the faith has mm. never been presented that way before. So they said, okay, hold on, hold on. We need to do Inquisition. So he went before the Inquisition, and guess what? They said, hey, this stuff's pretty good. Go get yourself some training. 
So that's when he went to France and became a priest and he ended up founding the Jesuits. <laughs> so, so, so that was the purpose of the Inquisition. So really don't get caught up in the, in the black legend, start learning the truth about what really happened during that time. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, do you know, just uh, another, another question thrown in there, uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen had these rosary beads that had a rainbow color on them. Did you, do you know anything about that? No. And what was it? No, no I, I haven't heard either. Anyway. Well, well, I mean, remember the rainbow in, in the Bible is a sign of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Although it's been contravened now, you know, yeah. now in, in our culture, it means something else. Um, you know, but but the but the uh, the um, uh, the the rainbow was a sign of God's covenant. Remember, at the, at the end of with uh, Noah and the ark, the, the the rainbow was a sign of the covenant that God will not send water to destroy the earth again. So, yes, spot on. That's and that's the, the true meaning. Um, we've got a few minutes. So I want to I want to plug a few things you're in, and I'd like to invite people to visit your website first and foremost. How do people get in touch? At deaconharold.com. Um, You've also got an app. Can you tell us about that? You have an app. Yeah, it, yeah. It, you know, it's just it's just <laughs> crazy. Well, you know, Charbel and I, you know, we we've traveled literally, and, and maybe people don't notice that Charbel and I have traveled the world together. You know, um, we've been uh, a lot I of places, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we have been to a lot of places, including the Philippines. That's right. And and you remember we were both in the Philippines. In fact, this is you know the, uh, you you were having uh, those guys develop an app for you. And then they approached me after a talk I gave there and said, Deacon, we want to help you. I said, great. Uh, what can you do? They said, we'll build you an app. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so they built an app and, um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a real blessing. And so I have the app here. I'm not sure you can see. Oh, yeah, there is my little there symbol go. there. So if you go to your iTunes store, to your Android store, just type in Dynamic Deacon or Deacon Howe, do you see this, this black and white um, uh, logo yes. come up? I love it, the outline. This, yeah, the outline. You. And then you, and then you can access all my stuff here. But what's great about this is uh, if you go to more, it has a prayer request. So you can actually send me a prayer request. And during my, well, when I get oh, back nice. to adoration, I, I can pray for your specific intention during adoration. It has all my social media, YouTube. And like if I, well, when I start speaking again, if you hear me speaking live, you could take notes. And you can record the talk for your own personal use. Yeah. So there's a tremendous um, resources here through the app. And it's a great way of keeping up with, with what I'm doing, although I'm not doing much now. Although what I'm doing now, though, since I'm not traveling, I said, well, how can I stay connected? Because I, I, I got to tell you, Charbel, because what happened was I was actually at a parish um, mm. in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, that's when the whole thing first started and they were like putting these little bit of restrictions on. And so like half the people came to mass that would normally come, but they, they went ahead with the mission. So I did the mission the first night, literally as I was speaking the first night of the mission, a letter came from the Bishop saying, shut everything down. No more, you know, uh, that's wow. when they had the complete lockdown. So I literally was on a plane the next day back to Oregon. I've been here ever since. All my stuff has been canceled. I said, what can I do? To and I was, I was mad. I was like, what, Lord, yeah. what are you doing? This is how I'm going to provide for my family for this. The, I make the most money speaking yeah. during Lent for, the, yes. for that, that lasts me the rest of the year. What am I supposed to do now? I was just upset. I was mad. I said, you know what? Um, I got to trust God here. God knows what he's doing. And so I said, well, how can I stay connected with people? So I started something called a daily dose of Deacon Harold. <laughs> that's, that's said, you know, a daily do and basically what is it is a 20 to 30 minute little prayer and reflection time. So I, I've been doing novenas, you know, just to introduce, I'm doing St. Uh, Jared right now. Ah, yes. Uh, I'm doing a St. Jared novena right now, introducing people to him. And quite frankly, you, you know, the Charbel, cause you were with me. Um, you know, when we, when, when I gave the homily in St. Jared's church in Melbourne and they, it was on his feast day and had the relics of St. Jared there. And, and knowing my story, my mom uh, prayed to him because she could not have kids. And then I was born after through the intercession of St. Jared and Magellan. I was like, what? And so, um, so I've been doing these little, little prayer reflections. In fact, I just did the one on the rosary yesterday. If you want to know more about the rosary, listen to my daily dose of Deacon Harold. Just go to my Facebook page. So I live stream in the Facebook so, and, and on my YouTube channel. And next week on, I got my little schedule here. Next week on Wednesday guess what? I'm doing an entire daily dose about Perusia. 
Wow. <laughs> yep, I have it. I have my little sticky oh, note where kidding. I have my ideas about what I'm going to do the next week for the daily yeah. dose. And I have right here Wednesday of next week, Perusia. So I'm going to do a whole, in. <laughs> I'm going to do a whole daily dose just about uh, our relationship, how we met yeah, and wow, Perusia, wow, the impact awesome. Perusia has been having in the life of the church. And I've also done something called a uh, walk by faith Wednesday webinars with Deacon Harold. I do it every, I just yeah, do it every that week. About? Yeah, I'm doing it every two weeks now. It's just an extended time of um, catechesis about a particular topic. So um, I've talked about effective evangelization. Uh, we've uh, talked about um, finances, you know, uh, yeah. we've, so we just go about 50 minutes to an hour, go into much more detail, uh, much more in depth about a particular topic in the life of the church. So all those are available for absolutely free. I'm not charging anything. Um, absolutely free. Just go to my YouTube channel, which is Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. My whole name spelled out. YouTube.com slash Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And you'll see, uh, I have like, what do I have? If you go to my playlist, I have something like 578 really? videos, something like that. Yeah, um, wow. Yeah, so, but, but um, I, in fact, all my ones from Parisi are on there as well, you know, and, and uh, uh, so, so that's kind of been what, I, what I've been doing, kind of uh, that's staying awesome. busy and contributing to the life of the church, yeah. So, yeah, your Facebook page, lots of action there. Um, people can like that page. Um, and then there's the YouTube channel, there's the website. You are doing, you're part of a, a retreat or, or like a conference this weekend. Um, the Chastity Project are putting on... Um, a conference starting Friday, going over the weekend. Uh, that's Friday US time, so that's Saturday Australian time. Um, so that is the whole weekend for us, and it spills over into Monday for those in Australia. Um, but tell us about this this conference that you're um, you're featuring. It's it's over over seventy speakers are going to be part of this. Yeah, this is uh, this love is and like life the, conference. This is like the third or well, actually the fourth virtual conference I've been involved yes. in. You know, wow. so again, it's it's a, it's this is how how creative the church is. It's a mm. way of bringing content because none of us speakers can travel, so this is a way of bringing content um, to people, the message of hope in this time of of coronavirus pandemic. And so, uh, for this particular one, it's called the Love Life Conference. So it's about the nature of relationships, about the nature of covenant relationship. It's for um, teens, young adults, single married, people discerning vocation, the priest and religious life for no matter what state in life that you're wow. in. It's talking about how we can deepen and strengthen covenant intimacy with God because marriage and love has been distorted and twisted. And uh, again, and I've said this many times, instead of being made in God's image and likeness, we're trying in our culture today, we're trying to make God into our image and likeness. Yeah, so this true. conference is about recapturing a proper sense of the love of God. My particular talk is going to focus on pornography, uh, oh, the wow. dangers okay. of pornography for men and women, not just for not just for men, for men mm. and women. Um, how pornography is dangerous, what it does to our relationship, and, and very practical, real world, hands on things that we can do every day to break ourselves out of that cycle of, of, of pornography. That's what my talk is focusing on. But there are seventy other speakers talking about many many topics covering uh, all kinds of aspects of theology of the body and, and, and the true meaning Brilliant. of love and intimacy. Jay, Jason Everett will be part of this. Uh, Christopher West, Christophanic, a, a huge. Uh, Simon so, Carrington. Simon and, Carrington. And part is, That's yep, right. As well. Archbishop Julian Porteous uh, is on there. Dr. Ed Tree. All our favorites are on there. So this is your chance. This is mega. I mean, we're already at about 18,000 and climbing subscribers it's completely free this weekend make sure you go and, and be a part of it uh well i've just put the link in uh, in the comment section and you'll get to see deacon harold on there as well make make and the is that virtual um uh pentecost pilgrimage as well yeah uh, that's right happening right Did now you, as well so uh, um were you speaking on that did you, did you give yes. your talk on there i think yes. my talk was released well they said every week the they release a new one which which i think is this that's, week is going to be uh, today yeah it's, yeah it's gonna be i think it's gonna yeah, be released okay. today uh but so, yeah, my Wednesday, talk is about pilgrimage Sunday. and uh, what i do is pretty cool because i change my background and i show the different pilgrimage sites in fact many sites that we've been to charbel oh, on our nice, last nice. and i talk about the impact of pilgrimage how, how we're a pilgrim people you know yes. as we're because uh, our home is not here where's our home heaven 
that's what that's what we're pilgrimaging to. So I taught that I compare our pilgrimage journey on earth toward heaven uh, on these pilgrimages like to the Holy Land and to France and to Spain and the places that uh, that we've been to together, Charbel, and and talked about the impact of pilgrimage and encouraging people to um, to experience a pilgrimage in their lifetime and how that deepens their intimacy uh, with, with God by actually being in the places where our Lord walked and taught right. where the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared, where the great saints had their conversion experiences and turned their life over to Christ and did amazing things in the life of the church. You're actually there. And what that does for your faith, you know, when, when you're in these holy places. So, yeah. Amen. Wow. I'm going to check that out. I'm, I'm part of that. So, yeah, Pentecost Pilgrimage. Um, dot com as well that's that's happening as we speak and that leads us right to pentecost we are out of time um it, it is um still early morning for you um the sun is just probably rising now um yes, and it it's, it's quite late here in sydney so we're at the other opposite extremes uh, in time zones but i want to thank you so much for um accepting this and being so open and generous with your time deacon please know we're all praying for you we love you here especially guardians and saint charbel's community um and encourage everyone to, to, to visit the sites and pray for Deacon, but also join in, uh, in, the, in the life of the church. Every single evening, eight o'clock onwards, you've got adoration, we've got, we've got uh, rosary, there's the divine office and there's mass every single night. On Sunday, you can register um, and it's on the SOIA page. You can, you can register for upcoming masses uh, if, you want, if you're able to, to get there. And uh, that's at 7 p.m. Sunday mass. Uh, and afterwards there's a rosary as well so we are out of time that's another one i want to thank um the big lineup at guardians tonight what a big night um michael obeid uh is just pumped out his fourth week on the catechism and he'll be continuing this week after week so guardians is very uh, blessed to be partnering with uh, voracious media and michael obeid and his crew doing excellent work there uh, and that was tonight he was on at uh, seven o'clock and he'll be on again next week and we hope to bring more local and international speakers here uh, with on Guardian. So stay tuned, pray for us, subscribe, share this among family and friends, and, and we'll be in touch. So next week, we'll be back on. More information will be uh, spread out um, as, as you see the Facebook page. So thanks again. Shall we close in, in just a very quick prayer, Deacon? Sure. And Father, Would you Son, Holy us? Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, Lord, we, we talked about this time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic and, and lockdown. And uh, we ask, especially the prayer and intercession of the Blessed Mother. We talked a lot about the rosary. And so, Lord, we, we ask a special intercession of the Blessed Mother. You know, she's, a, she's appeared um, uh, in, in Guadalupe and Lourdes and Fatima and, and other places, uh, Akita and Cabejo. And, Lord, we ask you to open our hearts to listen to her message, her listen to her message of hope, listen to her message of confidence. And as we end this time in prayer, we ask for intercession. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with oh, thee. Blessed art thou blessed amongst thou women. Thou and Lord. blessed is the fruit of thy womb, blessed Jesus. The fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Mother pray, of God. For us sinners, pray for us sinners. Now, now at the hour, at of, the our hour death. of our death. Amen. Amen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Deacon, and thanks, everyone. God bless you, and, and stay in touch. I'm just going to be turning off this live stream now.